Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. Before we begin, I'd like to give a special shout out of thanks to new members of our Patreon family Len, Andrea, Veda, Lucy, Rachel, The Hillside Farm, Marguerite, and June from Murders, Mysteries, and Meows, a fellow cat lover. Thank you all so much for supporting this podcast. By becoming members of our Patreon, you help us cover the costs of recording, production, and distribution while keeping us 100% listener-supported and ad-free for everyone, and it's very much appreciated. And because you joined in the month of September, you and everyone who's already a member of Patreon or supports us via buymeacoffee.com with a one-time tip will be receiving a complete, uninterrupted recording of The Book of Tea by Kakuzo Okakura as our thanks for your support. If you're interested in becoming a member of Patreon or supporting us through buymeacoffee.com, you'll find links to both in the show description. Now, let's read and relax. Find a comfortable spot. Adjust your volume. Take a nice deep breath in. Let it out slowly. And off we go. Tonight, let's relax with more from a book about a beautiful planet. Mars and Its Canals by Percival Lowell, director of the observatory at Flagstaff, Arizona, non-resident professor of astronomy at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, member of the Astronomical and Astrophysical Society of America, etc., etc. Published by the Macmillan Company, New York, 1906. Let's pick up where we left off in Chapter 3, A Bird's Eye View of Past Martian Discovery. On comparing the maps of Schiaparelli, an eye duly directed is struck by a difference in the aspect of the lines. In his first map, the canals are depicted simply as narrow winding streaks, hardly even roughly regular, and by no means such departures from the plausible as to lie without the communicatory pale. Indeed, to a modern reader prepared beforehand for geometric construction, they will probably appear no canals at all. Certainly the price of acceptance was not a large one to pay, but like that of the Sibylline books, it increased with putting off. What he offered the public in 1879 was much more dearly to be bought. The lines were straighter, narrower, and in every way less natural than they had seemed two years before. In 1881 to 1882, they progressed still more in unaccountability. They had now become regular rule and compass lines, as straight, as even, and as precise as any draftsman could wish, and quite what astronomic faith did not desire. Having thus donned the character, they never more put it off. Now, this curious evolution in depiction points, rightly viewed, to an absence of design. It shows that Scaparelli started with no preconceived idea on the subject. On the contrary, it is clear that he shared to begin with the prevailing hesitancy to accept anything out of the ordinary. Nor did he overcome his reluctance, except as by degrees he was compelled, for the canals did not change their characteristics from one opposition to another. 
the eye it was that learned to distinguish what it saw, and the brain made better report as it grew familiar with the messages sent it. In other words, it is patent from these successive maps that the geometrical character of the canals was forced upon Schiaparelli by the things themselves, instead of being, as his critics took for granted, foisted on them by him. We have since seen the regularity of the canals so undeniably that we are not now in need of such inferential support to help us to the truth. But too late as it is to be of controversial moment, the deduction is nonetheless of some corroboratory force. With the third period enters what has been done since Schiaparelli's time. For that master was obligated from failing sight to close his work with the opposition of 1890. In 1892, W.H. Pickering at Arequipa was the chief observer of the planet and made two important discoveries. One was the detection of small round spots scattered over the surface of the planet and connected with the canal system. The other, the perception of what seemed to him more or less irregular lines traversing the Mare Erythrium. Both were notable detections. The first set of phenomena he called lakes. The second, river systems, sometimes schematically canals, but without committing himself to canaliform characteristics as his drawings make clear. The same phenomena were seen at that opposition at the Lick, by Shaberly, Barnard, and others, and called streaks. These discoveries took from the Maria their supposed character of seas, a most important event in knowledge of Mars. The next advance was the detection at Flagstaff in 1894 of their canaliform characteristics by my then assistant Mr. Douglas, who in place of the irregular streaks and river systems of his predecessors, found the seas to be crossed by lines as regular and as regularly connected as the canals in the light regions. To him they appeared broad and ill-defined, but so habitually did to him the canals in the light areas, while for directness and uniformity the one set showed as geometrically perfect as the other. All the dark maria of the southern hemisphere he found to be laced with them, and that they formed a network over the dark regions, counterparting that over the light. Still more significant was the fact that their points of departure coincided with the points of arrival of the bright region canals, so that the two connected to form in its entirety a single system. After the publication of his results in the Lowell Observatory Annals, Volume 1, 1895, Schiaparelli identified some of those in the Sirtis with what he had himself seen there in 1888, though his own had not been sufficiently well seen of him to impress him as canals. Of other additions to our knowledge since made by the writer, the present book treats, as also of the theory they originally suggested to him and which his later observations have only gone to confirm. Chapter 4 The Polar Caps Almost as soon as magnification gives Mars a disk, that disk shows markings, white spots crowning a globe spread with blue-green patches on an orange ground. The smallest telescope is capable of this far-off revelation, while with increased power, 
the picture grows steadily more articulate and full. With a two and a quarter inch glass, the writer saw them 35 years ago. After the assurance that markings exist, the next thing to arrest attention is that these markings move. The patches of color first made out by the observer are shortly found by him to have shifted in place upon the planet, and this not through mistake on his part, but through method in the phenomena, for all do it alike. In orderly rotation, the features make their appearance upon the body's right-hand limb in the telescopic image, travel across the central meridian of the disk, and vanish over its left-hand border. One follows another, each rising, culminating, and setting in its turn upon the observer's gaze. A constantly progressing panorama passes majestically before his sight. New objects replacing the old, with a march so steady and withal so swift that a few minutes will suffice to mark unmistakably the fact of such procession. But for all this ceaseless turning under his gaze, after a certain lapse of time, it is evident that the same features are being shown him over again. With such recognition of recurrence comes the first advance toward acquaintance with the Martian world. For that in all their journeying their configuration alters not, proves them permanent in place, part and parcel of the solid surface of that other globe. This surface, then, lies exposed to view, and by its turning shows itself subject, like our Earth, to the vicissitudes of day and night. In such self-exposure, Mars differs from all the four great planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Features, indeed, are apparent on the first two of these globes, and dimly on the other two as well, but they lack the stability of the Martian markings. They are forever exchanging place. In the case of Jupiter, what we see is undoubtedly a cloud envelope, through which occasional glimpses may possibly be caught of a chaotic nucleus below. With Saturn, it is the same, and the evidence is that the like is true of Uranus and Neptune. What goes on under their great cloud canopies we can only surmise. With Mars, however, we are not left to imagination in the matter, but so far as our means permit, can actually observe what there takes place. Except for distance, which, through science, year by year grows less, it is as if we hovered above the planet in a balloon, with its various features spread out to our gaze below. Attention shows these areographic features to be on hand with punctual precision for their traverse of the disk once every 24 hours and 37 minutes. For over 200 years, this has been the case, their untiring revolutions having been watched so well that we know the time they take to the nicety of a couple of hundredths of a second. We thus become possessed of a knowledge of the length of the Martian day, and it is not a little interesting to find that it very closely counterparts in duration our own, being only one thirty-fifth the longer of the two. We also find from the course the markings pursue the axis about which they turn, and just as the period of the rotation tells us the length of the Martian day, so the tilt of the axis, taken in connection with the form of the orbit, 
determines the character of the Martian seasons. Here again we confront a curious resemblance in the circumstances of the two planets. For the tilt of the equator to the plane of the orbit is with Mars almost precisely what it is for the Earth. The more carefully the two are measured, the closer the similitude becomes. Sir William Herschel made the Martian 28 degrees. Schiaparelli reduced this to 25 degrees, and later determination by the writer puts it nearer 24. The latter is the one now adopted in the British Nautical Almanac for observers of the planet. This is a very close parallelism indeed, so that in general character, the Martian seasons are nearly the counterpart of ours. In length, however, they differ. First, because the year of Mars is almost double the length of the terrestrial one, and secondly, because from the greater ellipticity of Mars's orbit, the seasons are more unequal than is the case with us, some being run through with great haste, others being lingered on a disproportionate time. It is usual on the Earth to consider spring as the period from the vernal equinox, about March 21st, to the summer solstice, about June 20th. Summer as lasting thence to the autumnal equinox, autumn from this latter date, about September 20th, to the winter solstice on December 21st, and winter from that point on to the next spring equinox again. On this division are seasons in the northern hemisphere last respectively. Spring, 91 days. Summer, 92 days. Autumn, 92 days. And winter, 90 days. On Mars, these become reckoned in our days. Spring, 199 days, summer 183 days, autumn 147 days, and winter 158 days. If we had counted them in Martian days, they would have totaled about one thirty-fifth less in number each. In its days and seasons, then, Mars is wonderfully like the Earth, Except for the length of the year, we should hardly know the difference in reckoning of time could we some morning wake up there instead of here. Only in one really unimportant respect should we feel strange. In months we should find ourselves turned topsy-turvy. But lunations have nothing to do with climate, nor with the alternation between night and day. And in these two important respects, we should certainly feel at home. Though the axis could be determined by the daily march of any marking, and thus the planet's tropic, temperate, and polar regions marked out, the process is made easier by the presence of white patches covering the planet's poles, and known in consequence as the polar caps. It is from measures of the patches that the position of the Martian poles has actually been determined. These polar caps are exactly analogous in general position to those which bonnet our own Earth. They reproduce the appearance of the ice and snow of our Arctic and Antarctic regions seen from space in a very remarkable manner. In truth, they are things of note in more ways than one, and would claim precedence on many counts. Priority of recognition, however, alone entitles them to premier consideration. Among the very first of the disks detail to be made out by man, they justly demand description first. 
With peculiar propriety, the polar caps have thus the paws. Not only do they stand first in order of visibility, but they prove to occupy a like position logically when it comes to an explanation of the planet's present physical state. It is not matter of hazard that the most evident of all the planet's markings should also be the most fundamental, the fountainhead from which everything else flows. It is of the essence of the planet's condition and furnishes the key to its comprehension. The steps leading to this conclusion are as interesting as they are cogent. They start at the polar cap's visibility. For their size first riveted man's attention, and then attention to them disclosed that most vital of the characteristics of the planet's surface, change. Just as almost all of the features we note are permanent in place, showing that they belong to the surface, so are they all impermanent in character. Change is the only absolutely unchanging thing except position about the features the planet presents to view. It was in the aspect of the polar caps that this important fact first came to light. Not only did they thus initially instance a general law, they have turned out to make it, for by themselves changing, they largely cause change in all the rest. But for a long time, they alone exemplified its workings. To Sir William Herschel, we owe the first study of their change in aspect. This eminent observer noted that their varying size was subject to a regular rhythmic wax and wane, time to the course of the seasons of the planet's year. The caps increased in the winter of their hemisphere and decreased in its summer, and being situate in opposite hemispheres, they did this alternately with pendulum-like precision. His observations were soon abundantly confirmed, for the phenomena take place upon a vast scale and are thus easy of recognition. At their maximum spread, the caps cover more than 100 times as much ground as when they have shrunk to their minimum. In the depth of winter, they stretch over much more than the polar zone, coming down to 60 degrees and even 50 degrees of latitude, north or south as the case may be, thence melting till by midsummer they span only five or six degrees across. In this, they bear close analog to the behavior of our own. Ours would show not otherwise, were they viewed from the impersonal standpoint of space. Very little telescopic aid suffices to disclose the Martian polar phenomena in this their most salient characteristics, and convince an observer of their likeness to those of the Earth. Anyone may note what is there going on by successive observations of the planet with a three-inch glass. Nor is the change by any means slow. A few days at the proper Martian season, or at most a couple of weeks, produces conspicuous and conclusive alterations in the size of those nightcaps of the planet's winter sleep. Resembling our own so well, they were early surmised to be of like constitution, and composed, therefore, of ice and snow. Plausible on its face, this view of them was generally adopted, and common sense has held to it ever since. It has encountered, of course, opposition, partly from very proper conservatism, but chiefly from that earth-centered philosophy which has doubted most advances since Galileo's time, 
and carbonic acid has been put forward by this school of skeptics to take its place. We shall critically examine both objections, the latter first, because a certain physical fact enables us to dispose of it at once. In casual appearance, there is not much to choose between the rival candidates of common sense and uncommon subtlety, water and frozen carbonic acid gas, both being suitably white and both going and coming with the temperature. But upon closer study, in one point of behavior the two substances act quite unlike, and had half the ingenuity been expended in testing the theory as in broaching it, this fact had come to light to the suggestors, as it did upon examination to the writer, and had served as a touchstone in the case. At pressures of anything like one atmosphere or less, carbonic acid passes at once from the solid to the gaseous state. Water, on the other hand, lingers in the intermediate stage of a liquid. Now, as the Martian cap melts, it shows surrounded by a deep blue band, which accompanies it in its retreat, shrinking to keep pace with the shrinkage in the cap. This is clearly the product of the disintegration, since it waits so studiously upon it. The substance composing the cap, then, does not pass instantaneously, or anything like it, from the solid to the gaseous condition. This badge of blue ribbon about the melting cap, therefore, conclusively shows that carbonic acid is not what we see and leaves us with the only alternative we know of, water. Chapter 5. Behavior of the Polar Caps Assured by physical properties that our visual appearances are quite capable of being what they seem, we pass to the phenomena of the cap itself. Like as are the polar caps of the two planets at first regard, upon further study, very notable differences soon disclose themselves between the earthly and the Martian ones, and these serve to give us our initial hint of a different state of things over there from that with which we are conversant on Earth. To begin with, the limits between which they fluctuate are out of all proportion greater on Mars. It is not so much in their maxima that the ice sheets of the two planets vary. Our own polar caps are much larger than we think. Indeed, we live in them a good fraction of the time. Our winter snows are, in truth, nothing but part and parcel of the polar cap at that season. Now, in the northern hemisphere, snow covers the ground at sea level more or less continuously, down to 50 degrees of latitude. It stretches thus far even on the western flanks of the continents, while in the middle of them, and on their eastern sides, it extends 10 degrees farther yet, during the depth of winter, so that we have a polar cap which is then 90 degrees across. In our southern hemisphere, it is much the same six months later, in the corresponding winter of its year. On Mars, at their winter maxima, the polar caps extend over a similar stretch of latitude. They do so, however, unequally. The southern one is considerably the larger. In 1903, 136 days after the winter solstice, in the Martian calendar, February 27th, it came down in longitude 225 degrees to 44 degrees of latitude, 
and may be taken to have then measured 93 degrees across. In 1905, 121 days after the same solstice, it stretched in longitude 235 degrees to latitude 42 degrees, and 158 days later, in longitude 221 degrees to latitude 41 degrees. Values which, supposing it to have been round, imply for it a diameter on those occasions of 96 and 97 degrees. It was then February 20th and March 10th, respectively, of the Martian year. These determinations of its size at the two oppositions agree sufficiently well considering the great tilt away from us of the South Pole at the time, and the horizonward foreshortening of the edge of the snow. It seems from a consensus of the measures to have been some five degrees wider in 1903 than in 1905, which may mean a colder winter preceding the former date. The cap was still apparently without a dark contour in both years, showing that it had not yet begun to melt. Less has been learnt of the northern cap. In 1896 to 1897, when it was similarly presented skirting the other rim of the disk, a gap occurred in the observations, corresponding to the time by Martian months, between February 24th and March 22nd. On the former date, the cap came down only to latitude 55 degrees, in longitude 352 degrees. On the subsequent one, and for several days after, the latitude of the southern limit of the snow was such as to imply a breadth to it of about 80 degrees. The cap was now bordered by a dark line, proving that melting had already set in. It cannot, however, at its maximum, have covered much more country than this, in view of its lesser extent on February 24th. Fair as our knowledge now is of the dimensions of the Martian polar caps at their maxima, we have much more accurate information with regard to their minima, and this too was obtained much earlier. That we should first have known their smallest rather than their greatest extent with accuracy may appear surprising, exactly the opposite being our knowledge of our own. It is not, however, so surprising as it appears, inasmuch as it is an inevitable consequence of the planet's aspect with regard to the sun. When the tilt of the axis inclines one hemisphere toward the sun, that hemisphere's polar cap was melt and dwindle, while at the same time it is the one best seen the other being turned away from the sun, and therefore largely from us as well, so that even such part of the latter as is illumined lies low down toward the horizon of the disk, where a slight change of angle means a great difference in size. It has thus come about that both the south and the north polar caps have been repeatedly well seen and measured at their minimum, and the measures for different Martian years agree well with one another. For the northern cap, six degrees in diameter is about the least value to which it shrinks. The south one becomes even smaller, being usually not more than five degrees across, while in 1894, it actually vanished, a thing unprecedented. Its absence was detected by Douglas at Flagstaff, and shortly after the announcement of its disappearance, 
The fact was corroborated by Barnard at the lake. The position the cap would have occupied was at the time better placed for observation in America than in Europe, inasmuch as the cap is eccentrically situated with regard to the geographic pole, and its center was then well on the side of the disk presented to us, while in Europe it was turned away. This, together with the fact that it undoubtedly came and went more than once about this time, accounts for its disappearance not having been recognized there, Hayes left by it, having apparently been mistaken for the cap itself. On Earth, the minima are much larger. In the Northern Hemisphere, the line of perpetual snow or pack ice in longitude 50 degrees east, runs about on the 80 degree parallel, including within it the southern end of Franz Josef Land. Opposite this, in longitude 120 degrees west, above the North American continent, it reaches down lower still to 75 degrees, so that the cap is then from 20 to 30 degrees in diameter. In the southern hemisphere, it is even larger. In longitude 170 degrees west, the land was found by Ross to be under perpetual snow in latitude 72 degrees. Cook had reached in longitude 107 degrees east, an impassable barrier of ice in latitude 70 degrees, 23 minutes. The season was then midsummer, January 30th. So that we are perhaps justified in considering 71 degrees south as about the average limit of perpetual snow or paleocrystic ice. This would make the southern cap at its minimum 38 degrees across. Pack ice with open spots extends still farther north. The pagoda, in 1845, was stopped by impenetrable pack ice in south latitude 68 degrees. And the Challenger, in 1874, encountered the pack in latitude 65 degrees on the 19th of February which corresponds about to our 19th of August, the time at which the sea should be most open. The limit of perpetual snow is thus lower in the southern than in the northern hemisphere. Here again, then, the two minima differ, but in the reverse way from what they do on Mars. From this, we perceive that the variations in size of the caps are much more striking on Mars than on the Earth, and that these are due chiefly to the difference in the minima, the maxima not varying greatly. And with that... I think we'll end this evening's reading from Mars and its Canals by famed astronomer Percival Lowell, who, even though he was completely wrong about canals, definitely increased our knowledge of the geography of Mars by leaps and bounds. If you'd like to read this fascinating work for yourself and see the diagrams, as always, you'll find a link to a free ebook from Project Gutenberg in the show description. If you'd like to connect, or suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, the best place to catch me is on Twitter at BoringBooksPod, or drop me an email via our website, www.BoringBooksPod.com. I always love hearing from you. Thank you so much for joining me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night.